All right. Welcome to another episode of the Investigating Pathways podcast. Today, I'm joined by Nick, the co-founder and COO of Shogun, a software company that at its core helps companies build e-commerce pages and websites. Previously, Nick founded Glass & Marker, which is a creative agency for tech companies. Nick, thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Nick, for those listening who don't know as much about who you are, could you tell me a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, Kind of as you put it, my name's Nick. Um, pr- probably most well known for uh, for co-founding Shogun with my business partner Finbar. Um, Shogun has two products. We have a drag and drop, low code, no code website builder that like seamlessly integrates into Shopify, big commerce, and other e-commerce platforms. And we have this new piece of software called Shogun Frontend, which replaces the entire front end of the tech stack, gives you all of those website building capabilities, but even more robust. Um, like for companies that are much larger, like mid-market enterprise, um, e-commerce companies. And it makes it so that the websites have no load time, which does really cool things for conversion rate. Um, But as you mentioned before that, um, creative agency, Glass & Marker, and um, that kind of gave me exposure to the technology industry and to startups. And that's kind of uh, uh, where I I got my start and then then moved uh, into tech myself, starting in Shogun. Awesome. So now I want to take a lot of steps back and talk about your origin story briefly. So could you tell me a little bit about your life as a kid leading up to the point where you sort of went to college? Yeah, gosh, my life as a kid leading up to college. Um, So yeah, born in 1985. Um, Getting up there, right? Um, (laughs) Let's see. Yeah. Um, Grew up in San Diego. Um, You know, my... um, my mother struggled with um, with some health stuff, so I was mostly raised by my father, um, you know, who's a, a awesome individual, has been very supportive of me all my life. Um, let's see, grew up grew up in San Diego, um, and um, yeah, from there I moved to the Bay Area with my father and my little brother when I was about, gosh, eight or nine years old. Moved to the Bay Area. And I think that like as a kid, I was always kind of interested in entrepreneurial endeavors. Like I was always like um, very curious about like being able to like start little businesses and, you know, stuff like that. I had like a little, um, what was it, like a, like a fireworks business or something like that, okay. um, in a, you know, in, uh, in middle school where I realized that kids love firecrackers um, and everybody had, you know, these big allowances, but I did not. Um, and so I was like, all right, well, I can go. And um, I think I was gifted some firecrackers and smoke bombs and stuff like that. And um, I ended up, instead of using those like a normal kid, I made a business out of it where I sold them, <laughs> got it, you know, got some money from that and um, and continued to buy more firecrackers and smoke bombs and stuff and create a little thing. So I always had this passion for business. Um, and yeah, you know, kind of... Um, you know, in high school, I was very into running. I was a cross country runner, track runner. Um, and, um, and I would say probably, you know, school was certainly of something where I kept up my grades and I had some interest in it, but uh, I had a very like intense personality. And so I'd get very into specific things. Um, and during high school, mostly, most of my life was being very fixated on long distance running um, and track and cross country. Um, and let's see. You want me to go to all the way through college? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I get, you know, when I got to college, um, you know, candidly, when I got to college, I, I struggled, you know, I, um, I fell into, um, uh, partying too much. Um, and that was something that I had been kind of wary of, you know, cause my, you know, my mother had, um, had, uh, really struggled, you know, struggled with alcoholism and, you know, that had, um, uh, that had, uh, resulted unfortunately in her passing um you know when i when i was 16 years old um and i knew that alcoholism was something that um that ran in my family and that you know was was something to watch out for and i ended up um you know kind of finding myself having those same struggles um you know uh in in college and i didn't really know how to deal with it um or or address it at the time Um, But I knew, you know, by my junior year that it was something where I, you know, I wanted to get help. I wasn't enjoying partying all the time. I realized it was more a problem than anything else. 
Um, and so I, um, so I took some, some time off for, you know, from school and, um, and yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, I, you know, now I, I don't drink anymore. Haven't drank for about 13 years. Um, wow. yeah, I guess it's yeah coming up on 14 years, maybe at this point. Um, and, um, and, you know, now that I wasn't, um, you know, preoccupied, uh, with all that partying and kind of, um, you know, some could characterize it as, as somewhat destructive behavior. You know, now I had all of this additional bandwidth in my life to focus on other things. And I found that passion for business and that kind of, um, you know, my intense personality really focusing up on business um, in my last year of college. And I was, uh, you know, UC San Diego, I had created the Rady School of Management. Um, I took some innovation to market courses um, by a wonderful professor named Del Foyt. Um, and they really inspired me, especially the entrepreneurship stuff. I just found to be incredibly fascinating. Um, and, um, and so even though, you know, my degree was political science, public policy, uh, wasn't business at all. I, you know, was kind of realizing my final year of college that I had this passion for business. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of where the, where the story leaves off in terms of, uh, in terms of college, but obviously there's, there's quite a bit more that happened after college. So I'll sure. pause there because I realize I'm going on a bit of a rant. No, no worries. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good segue into what I was going to ask next actually, which is, I want to talk briefly out of your first job, about your first job out of college at, I believe it was translations.com. Yeah. So could you tell me a little bit about sort of what you worked on there and was there anything super interesting or impactful there that sort of shaped the way you think about, I guess, the world writ large today? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. Um, I was so honored to get that job at translations.com. You know, um, I got that job, what was it? it? Must've been spring of 2009, right? And the market had completely crashed mm -hmm. um, in that fall of 2008, right? I think I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah. Um, the whole subprime mortgage crisis. And um, getting jobs was incredibly difficult. I think I probably applied to, I want to make sure I'm not exaggerating here, probably between 50 to 100 jobs I applied for. Um, and I got rejected from like all of them, including Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Enterprise Rent-A-Car totally rejected me, said I had the, the, the wrong attitude. And so translations.com was the, was the only job I got. I got a job as a sales associate. Um, and I was... Um, I was uh, reporting to and fortunate enough to work with an amazing VP, uh, Martha Geller, um, there. And I was reporting directly to her as a sales associate. My job um, was, uh, let's say, rather unsophisticated. I did 200 cold calls a day. And I was, um, <laughs> I was uh, not particularly successful <laughs> in selling okay. stuff. Um, I was trying to sell into consulting firm Vertical, trying to sell these translation services and software. And, but I had pretty strong work ethic. You know, I, I worked like six days a week. I would come in on Sundays and I would stuff envelopes and do mailers all day on Sundays. Um, wow. And at that time, I didn't know, um, I knew that I was passionate about business, um, but I was still really thinking inside the box. And I, um, I remember thinking if I could, if I can just get an MBA, if I could just go to Harvard or Stanford or, or, or you know, one of these schools and get an MBA, that would be amazing. That would, that would kind of take me to the next level, solve these problems, um, you know, in terms of like, I wanted to just tackle um, problems that were a little more sophisticated than just doing cold calls, right? I'd just come from college yeah. where I've been really excited doing those business projects, you know, that I was doing um, in my last year of college. And all of a sudden going from that to just cold calling, I was like, hey, I can do more than this. Um, and so I, um, I got really interested in how could I get back on track and go and get an MBA. And, um, and I knew whatever through my basic research, it seemed like MBA programs, they liked people that had consulting backgrounds. And so I applied to Accenture, I applied to Deloitte, I applied to also like um, these market research firms, um, like the corporate executive board and Forrester Research that had consulting as, as a practice, but were market research firms. Um, and I got rejected from all of them, except for Forrester Research, where I got a very, very basic, very entry level uh, client services job, um, where I was basically doing the same thing. I was if not doing cold calls, but just, you know, 
uh, basic, basic scheduling of, for these, um, you know, uh, calls for analysts. So now I'm not even on the phone. Now I'm the one scheduling the calls. <laughs> and, um, I got that client service job and, um, you know, I was working at Forrester for probably a year or two. Um, and a, a very important thing happened. Um, I had a friend, a guy by the name of Jesse Tarnoff, um, you know, who's the, uh, um, you know, I would later go to found, uh, glass and marker with Jesse had failed out of college. Um, but, you know, is somebody who just has talent, you know, yeah. coming right out of them in all directions, right? And he, even though he had failed out of college, he had started an incredibly successful um, video business called Sandbox Love. They were doing these super high-end wedding videos. He was written up in Martha Stewart magazine multiple times. And, um, you know, I, I said to Jesse, uh, you know, Jesse and I were talking one day, and he was like, um, you know, Nick, uh, why don't you come, why don't you come work with me? Why don't, you know, I see this opportunity in marketing and advertising for technology companies. I've been doing a lot of this work as, as contractor work for this agency. Um, you should come do, you know, start a business that specializes in technology video. And I was like, ah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working at Forrester now and trying to go and, you know, do this MBA thing. And he was like, well, why do you want to go to an MBA? And I was like, oh, well, well, because I want to go. And I've, I've heard that if you go and you get an MBA, you can go and potentially become a consultant, a business consultant and tackle these difficult problems. And you can make a bunch of money. I, I heard you could, you could even make, you know, whatever, over 300K a year or something like that. You know, if you're one of the, one of these, uh, you know, and, and he looked at me and he was like, dude, I made that last year doing my wedding videos. <laughs> so I don't know, you know what I mean? He's like, you need to think outside the box. And that's what Jesse really, you know, uh, pushed. He was like, he pushed further, you know, and was like, what are, why, you know, why are you looking at things this way? Um, you know, and because eventually I think that I actually did want to start my own company. I think that some, you know, and I was still young at the time, right? Um, but that was this narrative in my head that was like, you had to get an MBA to be a successful business person. And Jesse really challenged that um, and, um, and encouraged me to come and start Glass and Marker with him. And that was one of the most pivotal things. Um, that I did for my professional career, I almost decided to start thinking outside the box. Awesome. Before I ask the next question, can I just say, you know how to tell a hell of a story. That was amazing. But <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know um, at Forrester, you were still working at Forrester, right? When you started working with Jesse on Glass and Marker. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious, what was it like? Well, first, what made you want to be an entrepreneur besides just the kick in the ass from Jesse? And, yeah. um, like sort of what was it like to be working on both of those at the same time? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that, as I mentioned, you know, I'd always been really interested in business and entrepreneurship. There was a lot of it that appealed to me. Um, I really, even though I was somebody who, uh, whatever, up until that point had been thinking inside the box, I knew uh, that I actually, uh, you know, it was difficult for me to follow other folks' rules, you know, or at least uh, enjoy it, right? Like working in bigger companies, and that's nothing against translations.com or Forrester Research. They're fine companies. But um, but yeah, I think that I, um, not that I had problems with authority or whatever, but I was, you know, I wanted to kind of do things my way. Um, and, um, and that's, uh, you know, uh, I would say that that's not not really how business works. That's certainly not how work, good things go at Shogun. Um, but, you know, but at the time, maybe it was the naivety that I felt, okay, well, if I'm an entrepreneur, have my own company, I can be in control of things and I can kind of create things the way that I see them, right? And some of those being rather important things, like right out the gate, I was like, you know what? I think that like work should be fun and there should be work-life balance. And, um, and Work shouldn't be a thing where it's like, you know, show up every day at, you know, 8 a.m. and leave at 7 p.m. And that's how you know you're on the path to getting promoted. That's silly. It's not about that. It's about driving results. It's about doing good work. It doesn't matter when you start or when you end, right? Um, and I had some of these things, in, you know, in my mind that were appealing about going and having my own business. Um, and I think that all of it, um, I don't know. I think I was just, I was just motivated to do it. I wanted something that was my own, that I, you know, that I real ownership stake in, um, in terms of, um, in terms of how it was, um, it was challenging and wonderful and everything in between. Um, you know, for me, uh, candidly, it was, it was, uh, um, Jesse, um, uh, you know, it was Jesse and my, and our other business partner at the time who was, you know, who, who left Glass and Marker uh, as well a few years back, also by the name of uh, Nick. 
Um, and um, it was the three of us and they, the two of them were working on it full time and they were grinding like literally seven days a week. I mean, you know, I caught up with Jesse the other week. I think he, you know, he was saying he barely slept the first couple of years that we started Glass and Marker. Me, I was, I was still at Forrester, you know, for quite a while while I was starting Glass and Marker. And I gave Forrester a heads up. I let their HR department know and everything. Um, and I went and um, I, you know, I worked two jobs. So I'd get off Forrester and I would head over to our work live loft in Jack London Square, Oakland. And I would go work the rest of the afternoon well into the evening. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was tough, but I love you. But you know, when you're working on your own business, the, at least for me, um, I don't know, you just, you have such love for it and passion to it. Like I would literally clean like the bathrooms at our work live loft. You know, we had like a couple, you know, we, ended up, you know, we hired a couple people, we bootstrapped, you know, glass and marker, um, thanks mm -hmm. to actually Jesse put down a loan that helped glass and marker get bootstrapped. Um, and, um, you know, we were, we were like, hey, I was going to I was going to do everything. I would clean the place and, you know, and, you know, no job, no job was too small, no job too big. Right. Um, and I, I loved all of it. Um, but, yeah, it was tough. You know, I had to boot, bootstrap it. And I I remember the day that I um, handed in my resignation at Forrester and started flipping over to Glass and Marker full time. And that was a, a wonderful day. Um, uh, and, yeah, it was kind of it marked like a new chapter um uh for for glass and marker um as as well um but yeah it was tough We're working two jobs at the same time um is uh, it's no joking matter but hey you know i i strongly believe in bootstrapping um and you know shogun was bootstrapped as well and you know if you're bootstrapping uh, often that means that you're working multiple jobs so. awesome and so I'm, I'm curious, when did you decide like you were going to go full time on Glass and Marker? Sort of what was the litmus test that you were going through that at this point I should leave Forrester to work full time on Glass and Marker? Yeah, I think that it, it was just clear that, you know, Glass and Marker, I forget what the revenue was at the time, but it was considerable. Um, it was probably actually I think it was like seven figure revenue at that time. Um, wow. and, it, and it was to the point where I could pay myself um you know uh i mean it, you know we could all it was you know whatever we were past ramen prof ramen profitability as they talk about with y Combat, yeah. right we were at a point where hey you know my um my uh, salary at um glass and marker could easily outdo my forester um salary it was getting to the point where my salary at glass and marker could outdo my forester and glass and marker combined salary where i've been paying myself less like part yeah. of you know, like um uh, uh proportionately to my other business partners right and i was like this is you make an easy decision um and you know we had a strong pipeline like it was clear that this business often with agencies you spend a lot of time getting it off the ground building your brand right building that reputation and once once people know that like they want a glass and marker video right they just don't want any video not just yeah. any video agencies do i i saw a, you know a bunch of glass and marker videos i love those videos i know that if i work with these guys they're going to do it right and we had um we had gotten that reputation for ourselves um and so um so yeah it was it was pretty easy to make the switch and um, I think we we're at the point where we we're expanding, moving into much bigger um, office space, hiring a lot of team members, all that type of stuff. So it was it was time to it was time to make the change. Got it. So towards the end of your time with Glass and Marker, I'm curious, how come you sort of ended up stepping away from the company um, to work on, I guess, Shogun at the time? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. It was one of the hardest decisions that I ever made, um, to be candid with you. Um, I think that for me, I, you know, we got, we got to work with some really cool startups, right? And we were doing, you know, now uh, Glass and Marker and they are, do, they are doing amazing. You know, now they, I think they got to, you know, they, I think they're also like in Los Angeles as well as the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. You know, they really figured out that niche of um, IPO videos, right? You know, where you okay. see now there's Slack, Zoom, Zora, you know, totally all these videos that they've done. It's, it's incredible. Like their, their work is much different from, you know, in many ways yeah. from, from when I was, um, you know, from when I was uh, uh, running the company with Jesse. And, um, but at the time we were doing these explainer videos for startups, some of which you probably heard of like Cruise and Soylent. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is cool. This is really cool. And, um, and I saw um, some of these folks, you know, we'd be doing these videos for them. And when we were doing them, it was, you know, their, their company was nothing but just like two people, 
you know, um, no office, nothing. They were in this Y Combinator, you know, thing. And I, you know, we make a video for them and I, and I go visit them to, you know, to do their, their next video later and I visit them in some office and they'd have like, you know, 50, hundred people in an office. And I was like, oh my gosh, you are, you are moving at, at the speed of sound um, with your business. Like, what is this? And, you know, then you, you learn that, um, you know, glass and marker, um, is an, an incredible agency. It's incredibly talented people. And when you're doing that, when you're an agency, you're an agent of talent effectively. So in order to scale, you have to find more talent and you have to find talent at the same quality um, that yeah. it has been and get them on that vision. It's really hard to scale services um, where you have that uniqueness. I mean, glass and markers, art, it's creativity, it's talent, right? That is tough to scale. And I, was, I found these startups very interesting because they were working on hardware or software or apps that could scale infinitely, right? You could just as easily serve, um, well, not, not completely, this is a, I'm speaking in generalities, right? But you could, you know, you can make that software once, you know, just as easily give it to one person as to a million, right? Obviously, it's not that simple, but yeah. you get the idea, right, of scalability. And so I think that that was just very interesting to me. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, startups are just, um, that is some incredibly um, uh, <laughs> kind of thrilling um, uh, business to work on. Um, and I also found uh, the competitive nature of it um, to, be, um, to be pretty intriguing as well. I mean, you know, with, with, uh, with agencies, you know, you build that brand, build that brand. Obviously, you have to defend it, right? And you have to continue to hold that quality. Um, but it, it, it's pretty stable, right? Whereas tech, it's, you know, it's these winner take all markets or top yeah. three markets that are highly aggressive, highly competitive landscape is constantly changing. And I was attracted, you know, to that challenge. Um, and it was a really difficult decision. Um, but, you know, I, I had found myself reading the lean startup. I'm reading all of Paul Graham's essays, learning more about this Y Combinator thing. Um, talking to, you know, talking to my friends, uh, ta talking to my friend, Karen, my friend, Karen Chang, uh, introduced me to Finbar, you know, my business partner, started talking to him. Um, and, you know, and, and, um, and our, you know, uh, uh, we, we had a, another co-founder who started Shogun, but, you know, left uh, early on, uh, Damien Khan. Um, and, um, and just talking with them, I was just really energized. And I was like, I got to do this. I got to go try this. I was 29 years old. And I was like, hey, if I'm going to go make a big move, I should, I don't know. I just felt like I should do it now. You know, I'm about to be 30 and I just want to, you know, if, uh, Hey, go for it. Um, and, and that was, um, a hard decision. It was a big decision. I think that if I truly knew the weight of the risk that I was taking, making that decision, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I was a little naive to it at the time, <laughs> uh, cause it was pretty scary, but I, I took that leap from glass and marker and leaving an agency that was at that point doing millions, um, in, you know, in annual revenue. Um, to go try to start a tech startup. And I was in for um, an extraordinarily rude awakening on how difficult <laughs> tech is um, when, I, when I made the jump and started working with Finbar and Damien on Shogun. Got it. Um, and I'm also just so curious, how did you, did you sort of have to acquire tech skills along the way? Because you sort of went from public policy in college to sort of uh, talent management and sort of this agency at Glass & Marker after some data work. And then you've moved into tech. I'm sort of curious, how did you manage that pivot of, I guess, your skill set over the years? That's a, an extraordinarily good question. Um, and um, I think that I just had, I brought that, you know, I, I just, I have this incredible intensity about me that when I start to get interested in something, I just keep going and keep going and keep going. And luckily, when I started working with Finbar and Damien, but, you know, Finbar really is an exceptional teacher. And um, I remember in our early weeks, you know, um, working out of, you know, um, out of this, uh, this kind of, uh, it was, well, like a three-story home that was actually um, uh, uh, owned by this dude, uh, Damien's oldest brother, Justin Kahn, who's, you know, well-known for starting Justin.tv, which became Twitch. And I remember being in the back room and Finbar literally sitting down and teaching me how the internet works, how software works, what all these terms are, how it all fits together. 
And we had multiple of those sessions and those sessions would last hours. And I would take rigorous notes um, during those sessions and, and um, pay, uh, pay a, a, good deal, um, a, good, um, a good deal of attention to the details of what Finbar was explaining to me. And I didn't lose that passion for understanding tech and having a technical mind um, as, you know, as we grew, I, I still, um, I, you know, I'm still learning every day um, you yeah. know, with, with Shogun in, in terms of that, but there was a learning curve. I think that I just ran at it um, very, very fast. So. Gotcha. And so now I'm curious, where did sort of the idea or inspiration for Shogun come from? Cause it's not like e-commerce is obviously very, uh, a very common industry, I guess now in tech, but then you sort of settle in the specific niche, which is, creating, I think at the beginning, the back end to integrate with Shopify, right? So how did that sort of come into play? Yeah, so actually the initial concept for Shogun um, uh, came out of Finbar's pain point. Finbar, full stack uh, software engineer, Rails engineer. Um, and, um, and he was basically working at startups and every startup he worked at, he found himself building a version of Shogun which was effectively a way for the marketing and you know the marketing team members at the startup to make updates to the website um, without having to go through engineering, right? Because a lot of the, the projects that he was working on, they were web applications built on Rails. And so he found himself building a basic version of Wix or Weebly or Squarespace for Ruby on Rails um, wherever he was going. And so um, Finbar and Damien basically, they reckoned hey, what if we built a drag and drop page builder like Wix or Weebly, but that could integrate into any existing framework like, you know, like Rails, Node, Laravel, Django, et cetera, right? And so the original version of Shogun had no e-commerce application whatsoever. It was for different framework. Okay. Um, and um, when I joined them, um, we, were, we were trying to validate where we could sell it. And because, uh, you know, Finbar and, and Damien, they had, you know, they had a hypothesis of, okay, startups want that. A few folks had told, uh, you know, Finbar and Damien, hey, if you build this, we'll use it. But then they weren't using it. They weren't actually, after they built the first version of it, they weren't adopting it. And so when I approached um, Finbar and Damien and initially was like, hey, you know, like, I, like join the team. They're like, ah, I think we're good, actually. We don't know if we need, like, you know, a, another co-founder who can do sales, you know, like... Um, uh, you know, I was pitching myself being more sales, marketing oriented, more detail yeah. oriented. And um, they were like, we don't know if we need that. And then, you know, then um, I think that they found themselves having a bit of trouble trying, you know, getting to um, actually sell the product. And so that's when I joined them and started, um, started creating hypotheses, trying to sell the startups first. After that was kind of invalidated, you know, or have got minimal progress there, tried selling to enterprise got minimal validation there, tried selling it to agencies. And now we're six months in and not, no one's really interested, man. We picked up like a couple of clients, but this last agency um, that I had known through connections, um, I think with Glass and Marker, just in my network, we went in and we pitched them and they're like, no, we don't have a need for this, not for Ruby on Rails. But you know what? We have a bunch of clients on Shopify and, um, you know, we actually, Shopify's native content management page building capabilities um, have left us wanting. And if you can actually make this, you know, Shopify is built on Rails. If you take this Ruby on Rails page builder, make it work seamlessly with Shopify, uh, we would have clients for you today. Um, and so we went and, you know, Finbar started doing his research and he was like, hey, Nick, check this out. Shopify's got this app store. And so we integrated Shogun into the Shopify app store, right? And, um, and then actually, we kind of gave up. We actually, we hacked on other ideas. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, Damien uh, kind of, you know, he went off and decided to go work at Alto Pharmacy. Um, and, you know, Finbar went off. He went and became internal at Y Combinator. Um, I, you know, continued to hack on some ideas for the next several months or more um, with a guy named Tristan Zier who had gone through YC. Um, and, um, and we, nothing worked, man. And, and at that point, like it would have been a year, I took a whole year and here I was a year later and none of these startup ideas had worked. And I was like, oh my gosh, I left my agency. I sold back my partnership and all that stuff. And so I got no job. Um, I don't have my agency that I started anymore and I got nothing. 
All I got is this Shogun, uh, you know, page builder that's a side project at this point. It was a side project that just Finbar and I were working on. Um, and it was, you know, it was pretty small chips at that time, you know. Um, but we actually should have been looking a little closer because like looking at the growth rate, even as small as it was at the time revenue wise, the growth rate was very consistent. And so a year and a half later, we were, you know, where at Finbar had been working at YC, I'd actually moved abroad um, and, um, and did some uh, consulting work for like, um, for about a year. But, um, you know, we had basically tabled Shogun in fall of 2015 as a side project. Um, spring of 2017, I think Shogun Page Builder in its Shopify uh, app inception was doing, I think like 20,000 monthly recurring revenue and growing at a decent clip. Wow. And so we were like, okay, and we had never taken venture capital. We bootstrapped this thing. So we were like, okay, let's go back on this full time. And by fall, you know, we're applying to YC and, um, and they're like, page builder for Shopify, how big can this be? I mean, you guys are sharp, your growth rate's impressive. You're at 30,000 monthly recurring revenue. We're like, now we're like 40,000 monthly recurring revenue. And they're like, oh, well you've grown even in the past couple of weeks since you submitted your applications. Like, oh yeah. And you know, we actually misreported, we got into Y Combinator, we misreported a demo day. We were actually at like 1.2 million ARR fully bootstrapped. Wow. Um, and we closed our entire seed round before demo day. Wow. So I realized I sped, I sped up there and told you even, even more, but that kind of brings you up um, through, um, through the bootstrapped phase and, and, you know, and us doing, doing the Y Combinator thing. But Absolutely. So uh, I do want to take a step back quickly, and I, ha I just have to ask: How did the name Shogun come up? Where did where did that pop in from? Yeah, totally. So it's a book that uh, that Finbar is very fond of that he introduced me to, and I, I enjoyed quite a bit as well. It's a James Clavell novel um, called Shogun, and we enjoyed the book very much, especially uh, General Tornaga um, as a character, um, and um, and yeah, just enjoyed that enjoyed that novel, and uh, and so chose that as the name. Got it. So uh, I'm curious, what was, you know, when you first started working on the uh, company, you were like, this is no longer a side project. This is an actual company or a business, right? Yeah. What was your vision for the company when you first started and what were you sort of trying to achieve? That is a fantastic question. I don't think that we knew quite clearly. I think that we knew when we looked at it in spring of 2017, we were like, this has potential. You know, we were like, this could be, I think that our initial thing was, um, this could be an amazing side project. And then we're like, whoa, wait, this could be a pretty amazing lifestyle business. Whoa, wait, this could actually be a pretty nice, you know, private, just, you know, our like so software company, kind of small software company, but highly effective. Whoa, wait, e-commerce market's actually really big. Low code, no code for e-commerce market's actually really big opportunity. This mm -hmm. is a startup, you know, this is, this is a startup. And so that's how we felt going into Y Combinator was we were like, we think that there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and so our thinking around Shogun's potential really evolved. Um, and it's evolved even further with the creation of Shogun Frontend. Um, and, uh, and that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other um, aspect of the story is that we've, you know, the, the concept, even from when we were in Y Combinator back in winter of 18 batch, um, you know, the Shogun, Shogun as a company um, at that point in time, even the, the value proposition and, and the, um, uh, the, the mission um, has, you know, has evolved and adapted as, as missions do, um, you know, with, um, with kind of this new opportunity that we recognized in summer of 2019 um, around, um, around uh, uh, you know, the, um, interest in this new kind of architecture called headless commerce, but I'm, I'm kind of getting, you know, now, now I'm kind of, kind of rambling. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there. Let you, let you bring me back to back on track. Sure. So I just want to sort of follow on from that. Uh, I'm curious, were there any like major obstacles or hurdles that you all faced along the way besides like the initial lack of traction that forced you to do things like pivot, any other difficult decisions that you had to make along the way? Yeah, man. I mean, um, Startups are full. I mean, see, all it is, it is just decision after decision after decision. And a lot yeah. of them are difficult. And, you know, um, I found that startups, it is really, I, I mean, you hear this and it's a different thing when you live it. It's a roller coaster. 
you, you almost, you know, the, the, um, the swings in terms of how you feel um, and because of the challenges that you encounter, be those challenges around, you know, um, product fit, be those challenges around company building, um, be those challenges around uh, competitive landscape changing, right? Technology changing, you know, technology has even changed, you know, in the, in the past five years. I mean, that's a, kind of an obvious statement, but, you know, um, you, all of these things, I mean, they present opportunities, but opportunities and challenges are usually paired with each other. You yeah, know, in my experience, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that for us, um, you know, growing Shogun Page Builder and, and you know, seeing its continued growth, um, we wanted to expand. We wanted, we saw the, the clients asking for features, demanding things of our product that were beyond what we could do in, in Shogun Page Builder's capacity with how it integrates with e-commerce platforms. And so we had this epiphany in 2019 where we were like looking at the data. Um, Cause at this point we had, you know, at least, I mean, it got, it had to have been uh, 10,000 plus, plus clients at the time, I think with some paying clients with substantial amount of data. We were looking at a cohort of the largest users, right? The largest clients by, by, um, by revenue volume, by usage behavior, looking at their feature requests, looking at this more like, they want something that's like a mid-market enterprise solution. They want, you know, something that's more like a digital experience platform closer to Adobe AEM or Epi server um, or, um, or Sitecore. We were even starting to win um, clients to page builder that were coming from Epi server, an enterprise grade mm -hmm. digital experience platform. And I kind of had always had this thesis of digital experience platforms are just grown up page builders not really, but you know, um, and we saw this um, emerging trend and interest in headless commerce, which um, basically merchants started to want to use a different piece of technology that controlled the visual presentation layer, the part of their e-commerce online store that shoppers can see, right? Um, that's different from the e-commerce platform itself. They wanted specialized mm -hmm. software for that, right? And the third thing was all these e-commerce, you know, you have mobile commerce increasing, increasing, increasing. Um, and site speed is just killing people, right? You know, you if you get that blue bar loading on Safari, people are going back to Instagram, back to Facebook. They're not shopping. They're like, that your bounce rate's going up, right? And all this tech, you know, Google had put out that progressive web application technology, you know, where it was like, oh, now, you know, using like these, uh, these different JavaScript languages and, you know, server side rendering, right? You can set your front end up so that you can get instant page load. And we were like, okay, we see this intersection of mid-market enterprise content management, right? And visual merchandising, page building need for these mid-market enterprise users. We see this headless commerce architecture that allows for decoupling of the backend e-commerce platform from the front end tech. And we saw the Jamstack come out, you know, um, that supports this progressive web application tech. We're like, let's take all that and make a product that encapsulates all that, make a platform. But hey, at this point, you know, this is 2019 and we had to get back and go do market validation and everything all over again. And we had to go build yeah. an MVP all over again for the second product as Shogun Page Builder is growing. So there's another challenge for you. We do that plus Shogun Page, Page Builder, what? Today it's like 18,000, 19,000 plus paying users. So you have that whole line of business to maintain as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, again, a bit of a rant, but uh, I don't know if that kind of touches yeah. some of the challenges and also that you're always, you're always iterating. You're always, piv you're, you're constantly pivoting. Yeah, if you're absolutely. In tech, yeah, you can never slow down, right? Um, you always have to iterate, know what's coming next, know the next, uh, try to predict the future. You know? Sure. So now uh, I want to talk briefly about your YC experience, because I know you mentioned Shogun yeah. uh, was in winter 2018. So for most founders that I've talked to so far, YC has been this sort of like transformative revelation where they just learned like an insane amount. And so I'm curious, what was the experience of Y Combinator like for you? And what were the most sort of valuable learning lessons or assets that you got out of it? That's a great question. Um, 
Y Combinator has been one of the most valuable and strategic partnerships that we have had to date. Um, and um, po possibly, possibly even the most. You know, they have been with us for a very, very long time. I would say Initialized Capital as well, you know, has been also with us for a very, very long time and a very deep partnership. Um, and we have, you know, we have new partners, you know, that we've worked with more recently that we also have a ton of appreciation for. But YC has been, you know, has been there from the start. And one thing that I think that people may not fully appreciate is that YC does not end with that three month program if you continue, right? Um, if your company continues to survive and <laughs> startups, you know, it is mm -hmm. a battle to survive, right? Um, and so you go progressively deeper into the Y Combinator program as the years go on. In regards to Y Combinator core, which was that winter 18 batch. I remember that day one, even before we, you know, even before the batch started, the second they were accepted, they basically say, you start to have access to our resources. Finbar had been a software engineer at Y Combinator. So he knew everybody quite well. Finbar and I went in and we sat down with uh, Gustav Alstromer, who's a partner there. Awesome dude, super nice dude, very, very sharp dude. We sit down with him and we're like, to talk about uh, KPIs and metrics and stuff. Now, Finbar, of course, full stack engineer, technical CEO. He's like, he's got Chartio all set up. He's doing all kinds of, you know, measuring these SaaS metrics. And, you know, Gustav is like, do you, you know, are you tracking X, Y, you know, are you tracking ABC? And we're like, yeah, of course, man, you know, we've got that. You know, but then he went and he was like, are you doing X, Y, Z? And we're like, okay, okay. Now, you know, talking about why those are important immediately day one, you know, they're helping us, you know, they're, they're, they're able to adapt to whatever point we were at on the curve. Um, the other thing is Y Combinator um, really made it very, very easy to, and, and pretty painless um, to raise capital, right? Got it. Demo day really is a forcing function for investors to have to make a decision and make a move before demo day occurs, right? You know, cause if you give an investor, uh, however much time you're going to give an investor to make the decision, they'll take up all that time. So you need a time constraint, right? And demo day did a great job of time constraint. Um, I would say though, that to be, to be candid, it's really been beyond core program. The Y Combinator has continued to be incredibly supportive with their alumni network, um, you know, um, members of their continuity fund have been incredibly, um, uh, you know, supportive of us and, um, and helping us be very strategic and thoughtful um, in these later stages of, of the business. Um, and, um, and yeah, the, uh, the program was great though, although to be candid, I had go, I went through every single one of those Paul Graham essays and watched, you know, just about everything on YouTube and read all the books and stuff. So was, some of it was a little bit of a review and, and I think that because, um, because we were, um, you know, so some of even the folks that were speaking to YC were like in our friend group or people that we, that we knew. So there, there was a little bit of uh, redundancy there during the core, during the core program for Finbar and I specifically, um, but um, still immensely valuable and, um, and, and even more so beyond the core program. Awesome. Um, now I want to touch on sort of the impact of COVID on the market that Shogun serves as well as the company itself. And so I'm curious, uh, when COVID hit, how was the general market of e-commerce affected and did that have any sort of downstream effects on the success of the company? And then after that, as sort of we're getting back to normal, things are going back to normal, how has that again changed um, the space you work in? That's a fantastic question. So e-commerce uh, surged uh, during the pandemic, right? Um, and we saw that and we grew, we experienced, you know, uh, markedly good growth during COVID. But to be candid, I think that in people's imagination, they see an enormous hockey stick. It wasn't like that. You know what I mean? Um, was it, you know, was it, was it growth? Oh yeah. Was it notable? Oh, for sure. But it's not as though, um, you know, uh, it just, um, that it's like all of a sudden, then you don't have to do any work <laughs> and things are just going to fly off the Richter scale. Um, but yeah, uh, the pandemic, obviously incredibly unfortunate. And I watched even some e-commerce verticals that, you know, let's say you're selling, you know, like travel equipment and stuff, you know, uh, really suffer terribly. But there were some like, you know, home home gym equipment and stuff that just all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at their percentage growth. And it did that for, um, for a lot of verticals. Um, and I think that um, 
moreover, what it did was it pressed the fast forward button down on what was what I consider to be inevitability, right? You're going to see more e-commerce adoption broadly across the spectrum over time. Because even in North America, we're only about 17% penetration for e-commerce. It's still early days, technically. And so we saw a fast forward button get pushed down, a lot of growth and new behaviors, right? We didn't revert back to where we were, you know, now that thank goodness people are, you know, things are getting safer, things are opening back up, but it's kind of like it went up and is, you know, maybe drop a little bit, but it's like kind of staying there, right? You know, cause you don't unlearn that behavior of, oh, now I'm used to kind of, well, I've been buying things on my phone every day for the past year, you know? Um, so those learned behaviors are staying with consumers. Um, I think the other thing that occurred of course was um, the venture capital market became uh, very fixated <laughs> on the e-commerce vertical. Uh, and the software companies that support e-commerce, um, you know, which obviously I'm, I'm sure you saw, you know, the um, the Series B raise, um, you know, that was uh, that was uh, preemptive uh, by you know by Excel, um, you know, and the uh, the Excel partner over there, um, uh, Ethan, had really done his diligence and watching the e-commerce SaaS market for um, you know for quite some time, and um, and I think that you know it was really just a couple months into the pandemic. You know, Ethan came to us and, and showed us all, all of the diligence that he had done and, um, and you know, was, um, you know, very good at, at showing us why a partnership with Excel for our Series B was a great idea. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, honored, honored to, uh, to work with Excel. Um, and, um, and that really has helped carry our company, um, you know, to, uh, to new levels and, you know, building out our executive team and all that. Um, so I think that uh, the pandemic's influence on the venture capital market um, specifically for e-commerce SaaS, but even I would say argue across the board, venture capital is like going crazy yeah. right now, right? But especially for e-commerce SaaS vertical. What about as a company, right? How has it affected us as a company? Well, interesting thing, Shogun has actually never had an office. We have always been a fully remote, fully distributed organization, right? Interesting. So yeah, everyone already was working from home. Um, so I think that we probably had a little bit easier of a time with the transition than some other companies. And I'm grateful for that, but I will say this, working from home and working at a fully remote company, if it's you know one that it's organic like Shogun or Zapier or GitLab or what have you, um, or it's something that's new where the company has been, you know, usually is an office-based company, but now folks are going in. Working from home during a pandemic when you have to because of quarantine and working from home voluntarily because that is in the company's DNA or what you prefer to do, they're two very different things, right? Yeah. You know, because uh, when you're, yeah, so I, I would just say that it's not as though it's, um, you know, our team members haven't uh, encountered challenge and adapting to that, you know, that quarantine and, you know, um, uh, as, as, as everyone has, has had to, and, and, you know, folks are fortunate enough to be able to quarantine at home. Absolutely. So now I just want to sort of move to the last three or four general questions that I, I ask everyone on the yeah. pod. So the first one is just going to be, what is like just one thing that you wish you had known when you were first starting out with any of your experiences in life, right? College, when you moved to the Bay, um, first company, Shogun, all that. Yeah. Um, uh, three things or just a couple things? Just one thing. Just one thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Think outside the box. You know, do, don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to be different and think outside the box. If you're all, you know, I think that if I could go back in time, like I, I would have, I would have loved to have studied computer science and engineering, even though I wasn't going to be good at it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, do the things that you find interesting, challenging. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, and, um, and don't, don't view life in a very rigid, very fixed type of way. Um, you know, be okay with going with the flow, um, and kind of, uh, challenging, you know, challenging the, the norm, especially if it's something, um, in an area where you're excited and passionate about, you know, take that risk and, and go outside the box. It's, uh, I think you'll be more happy having taken the chance and even failed. Um, than if you than if you never did it all and always kept thing you know played things too safe. Sure, um, that that's fair. Thing that's how the box sounds smart. Um, yeah. Um, next question is: At this stage, do you consider yourself and or Shogun successful in any definition of the word? Yes. Yes, I do. 
Um, I think that the team has done an amazing job. I mean, they have built two fantastic products that by my definition have achieved strong market validation. I, I, do, I use the Y Combinator definition of product market fit, which means that the demand for your product is so great that the infrastructure snaps under the sheer demand for the product. So I think we still have, you know, we still got room to grow into that, but I don't think many companies are actually at, you know, product market fit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we have two products that are, you know, now very successfully adopted by many merchants. Um, we have a, you know, a culture that I'm very proud of. Um, and a team that is very proud of their company. Um, and, um, and yeah, uh, if you look at the numbers of startups, just startups by the numbers, what do startups do? They, they fail, they die, right? From, from a numbers perspective. So the fact that we're still here, um, you know, all these years later, now 150 something team members strong. Um, and, you know, on, hey, I think we're at the very bottom of the Y Combinator's top companies list, but I'm so <laughs> proud to be there. Oh yeah, I definitely think we are successful, you know, and I'm, I am so proud of what our team has accomplished. Um, obviously we still have a long way to go. Um, and, uh, and I think we can, we can continue our success and trajectory of success, but yeah, I definitely do. And I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. So now I'm curious if you were back to being a teenager during everything going on, um, you know, sort of a transition to a more online oriented world, what would you sort of work on? Would you build something? Would you go back to like making money by selling something other than firecrackers? Hmm. Uh, sort of what would your, your move be? That is a fantastic question. Um, yeah, I think that I absolutely would, um, would learn to code and create, right? Um, or, or not even, I mean, hey, now there's so much low code, no code software out there, right? You know, but it's like, um, learn technical skills, learn to create, right? Um, and I think that creating uh, something that's, uh, you know, whatever, um, you know, what web applications, uh, mobile applications, stuff that can be consumed in here, you know, in the, you know, in this thing, these are, you know, that's, that is an amazing playground to go create products for people to experience and enjoy. But to be, to be honest, dude, you know, I was thinking about it, oddly enough, I think it was the start of last, maybe last week, maybe it was this week, time just blurs together. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is going to sound crazy. When I was, when I was, how old were you? 16. Or 16. When I, was, when I was your age, yeah, or maybe just a touch younger. The mobile phones weren't really a thing. I think I would get a Nokia, you know, you could literally pound nails with that thing. Um, I think I would get a Nokia um, a couple of years later. Um, but you know, that was back in the day where like high tech was like a V tech, you know, cordless phone, you know, that you could walk around the house with, you know, still, some of them still had like the, you know, rotary dialer thing on it. Right. You know, um, and dude, for me, like I would grab my skateboard and run outside and like, go like skate and meet up with, you know, you tell your friends like, Oh, let's go, let's meet here. And there were no phones. So you just have to like choose a meeting place and be like, we'll meet in a general hour. And it would be wonderful. Cause I would just get outside and relax and hang with my friends and skateboard and not spend all of my time in my computer, in my phone or whatever. So I'd say like, listen, have fun with this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing this, I'm going to the internet, right? Have fun with it. View it as a place where you can innovate and create and enjoy yourself in, in, a, cre in a professional sense, in a creative sense, but also make sure to just like get outside, have fun, go skateboard, go hang with your friends, go lay in the park. You know, don't, don't spend all day hooked up to the internet. Like there's gonna be plenty of time for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if that's whatever. Uh, Absolutely. But yeah, I would say that, like, I'm, I'll tell you is, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, 35, almost 36, and I'm, I'm nostalgic for those days. So. Sure. So final question is just going to be, do you have a favorite number? What is it and why? Ooh, gosh, favorite number. I mean, I don't know. I always love the number three. I feel like that's probably like a pretty general response, but I just, I like things in threes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very particular and yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, three would be my knee jerk reaction. What's your favorite number? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer. I ask it to <laughs> everyone I talk to and um, I'm undecided. I'll get back that, to you on that one. That's totally fair. Yeah, I'll go with three though. Absolutely. 
All right, yeah, so um, I think that brings us to the end of what I had prepared. So I think that brings us to a really nice close. Um, yeah, so Nick, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the podcast with me today. Thank you, it's my pleasure.